So a couple of years ago, my little sister Isabel drew a picture of my family, okay? And she drew it now with like paint or like even like something as pointed as like colored pencils or pastels. She used like the old like nasty crowns we kept in a box somewhere in the basement. It's like, you know, when like all the stuff is like the wrapping is off of it and one's like hanging like a loose tooth, you know what I'm saying? You got to break the, the crown in half like nunchucks and you got to start crudely doodling out whatever you're trying to make. And so she made a picture like this and it was of my family. And uh, not gonna lie, it offended me a little bit. So here's the picture, okay? We've got my dad, big, strong guy, he's like 6'6". Six, six. My mom's got curly hair. Apparently she has one eye like a cyclops. And just as a disclaimer, this is not her actual picture. This is my reinterpretation of the picture because I think I burned the picture. But this is, what, this is my uh, dramatic interpretation of it. And so that's my mom. That's my sister, Tori, down there. She's like really creative. She's painting. That's kind of her thing. My brother, Alex, is like good with technology. So he's like got a computer. My brother, Jeff, apparently he's Amish. I don't know why I <laughs> drew like that. But he's like 6'6", six, six, so he's really tall. She made him like extremely tall. She was focused on that. Well, then, when I looked at me, now this is like six years ago. This is what I looked like. I was like, what? <laughs> I'm like, why'd you draw me like that? And she's like, well, you know. No, you're sick. And yes, I've like lived with an illness for like 10 years. And at this point, when she drew it six years ago, I was like having some stuff go on health-wise. But I was like, I don't want that to be my thing though. Like I don't want that to be what defines me. Like my sister got art, my brother got being really tall, and my dad got strong, my mom got like pretty hair. And I got dying. <laughs> I got dead. And so <laughs> I was really insulted by this picture. And this picture, I got insulted because this is what you call a caricature. Show of hands, who's ever heard of a caricature before? A caricature, when someone draws one, paints one, whatever, they're not going for accuracy. What they normally do is they pick one or two aspects of your looks or your personality and they exaggerate and embellish those. So like my sister could have drawn me and like put like a really long nose because it got kind of a long n nose. Like that would be a caricature. Or she kind of caricaturized something about me, which is that I was sick at the time. And I wasn't like laying in bed dying all day, but that's in her head. She's like, oh, I wanted to communicate that you were sick. It was offensive. It was inaccurate and exaggerated. And I felt like, and, I, and this is true of all caricatures, they... Pay attention to this. They fail to see the big picture. They fail to see the big picture. They give you this little microcosmic view into something. And as I've gotten older, I've realized, and this isn't in a negative way, it's not in a judgmental way, but some of the things that I grew up with in church when it comes to Christmas, I feel like are a bit, I feel like they're kind of caricatures of the Christmas story. Maybe caricatures of Jesus that I'm like, ah, I don't know, A, if that's super accurate, that might be a little exaggerated, and I don't know if it sees the big picture or quite captures it as accurately as we could. So let me give you some examples. And again, this was helpful to my spiritual formation, but as I've gotten older, and as you guys are getting older, and we're wanting to move you from this place to that place to this place to that place, continually move you forward in your faith and maturity and depth of insight, I want to talk about this. So here's one of the things I grew up in church seeing, this, this theme, Jesus, the greatest gift. Which is true, that's not untrue. Jesus is the greatest gift. But the only thing with this, this drawing of Jesus at Christmas time, is it kind of puts the emphasis on us. It's something that we are given for us. And that is good, and that is right, and that is true. But again, that's kind of just one aspect. Like a caricature, it's just kind of one aspect of why Christmas is important. And it doesn't quite capture the big picture of what's going on. Similarly, a couple years ago, I was working at this church, and we were trying to figure out like a good theme for Christmas. So I was consulting all these different creative websites, because I was a creative pastor at the time, and I was looking for all these things, and I found this like series, these series, and this artwork called Born to Die. Let's throw it up there. Born to Die. Which I thought was a little morbid, and a little violent, slash what parent volunteered their child for this picture? They put a baby in a casket! My gosh, that's so morbid, get it off the screen! Like what parent was like, I'll sign my kid up for that photo shoot, like, just make sure there's lots of blood around it. And so, that's not untrue, like Jesus did come to die as an atonement, as a sacrifice for many, and to forgive sins, but I feel like with the whole born to die thing, it's first of all like strangely violent and morbid, and secondly, it doesn't really take into account 
the life of Jesus. And it doesn't really fully explain or show the significance of the victory over death that Jesus procured, the, the victory over sin that Jesus demonstrated and exercised. So I don't know if that's like the most helpful model, but I heard a lot of that growing up. Like, born for this reason, just so he could die. And I'm like, whoa, you're missing a lot there. I feel like that might be a little bit of a caricature. It's a good starting place, and it's healthy, and it was helpful for me at the time. But what I want to do today is I want to get the bigger picture. And I want to tell the bigger story of Christmas and of the Christmas season. And it's a story, focusing on this, it's a story about a king. All right, so if you go to group later, and like, what was it about? What was the bigger story? It's a story about a king. And so today what we're going to talk about in this one-off, as we kind of wrapped up our Christmas at the movies up here, we're just doing this one-off called King of Kings, and we are going to talk about this theme of the kingship of Jesus. And we're going to start out, we're going to look at the big picture of Scripture, the big story of Scripture, and we're going to see how this is a pervasive, overarching view throughout Scripture. And we've talked about this before. There's certain themes that you can read Scripture through. So this time last year, we talked about peace, and peace is one of the overarching themes of Scripture. We could talk about rest. Rest is one of the overarching themes of Scripture. Sacrifice, one of the overarching themes of Scripture. Today, we're going to talk about the kingship of Jesus, one of the overarching themes. So what I want to do is we're going to sprint through the Bible and see how the story develops because this helps us grow in the grace and knowledge of God's word. But then we're going to talk about how the church has celebrated this fact, celebrated this story throughout the years, and then we're going to press in and I want to eventually land at this question because I don't want to just teach you about the kingship of Jesus and be like, all right, you guys have a Merry Christmas and walk off stage because you guys need something to do with that. You need something to process or something to ask yourselves. So I want to talk about the kingship of Jesus today with this landing point in mind, this question in mind. Let me throw it at you early. Start chewing on it. Start thinking about it. Who's in charge of your life? Who's in charge of your life? Who runs your life? As a society today, most of us would say, like, I do. I make all my own decisions. I'm autonomous in this. I decide what's right and wrong. How I feel determines what is right and wrong. Whatever I'm told to do, that's what I'm going to do. That's right and wrong. And what I want to submit today is that we should surrender everything to the lordship of Jesus, to the kingship of Jesus. And I'm going to more fully explain and fully, more fully expound upon what exactly that is. So let's jump into the word. Let's just do a flyby of the word, and I want to show you how this theme of the kingship of Jesus starts at the beginning of the Bible and runs all the way to the end. So in the first chapter of the Bible, we get Genesis, and in Genesis, the main character of the Old Testament comes to the fore, and it's this people group called Israel. And Israel's purpose and what they were called to was to be a light to all the other nations, to be a good influence. Like, so some of you as Jesus followers, you're called to be a good influence in your school, to show people God's grace and mercy and kindness, to show them what Jesus is like. That's what Israel was called to do. They're supposed to show God's grace, kindness, and compassion to other people. They're supposed to be a light to all people and a blessing to all people. But the problem is, Israel steps in mud again and again and again and again, and they fail to do that. And they have a ser series and sequence of bad leaders and terrible uh, judges and horrible kings. And then finally, they get this king named King David. And it looks like my man David is poised to actually pull it off, to do what Israel was called to do, to be a light to others, to be a blessing to others, to show people the character and nature of God. And David's a good king. He starts out great. And because of this, God makes a promise to David. Just as he made to David's ancestors, the, the people of Israel, that he would be with them and would be their God and multiply them and bless all nations, he makes a promise to this king named David. And we see this promise, and we see the first sign of this, this king, the first hint and, and inklings of this king in 2 Samuel 7, one of the most important texts in the Old Testament. And this is what a prophet of the Lord is speaking to David. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. I will establish his kingdom. Focus on that. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Everyone say forever. Not bad. Forever. 
And so there's this promise. Now, this promise begins to gain a head of steam throughout the Old Testament. And that's good because that promise needs to persist because David's goodness does not. David messes up. His son after him messes up. His two sons after him mess up and divide the nation. And then from that point on, it's a real poop show of different kings that come and kind of run the country into the ground and fail to do what Israel was called to do. And so they keep waiting for this king. They're like, well, when are we going to have a good leader? Because all these leaders are horrible. So they wait. And there's these expectations that start to build around this promised king from 2 Samuel 7. And so these guys named prophets that are sent to kind of call people out, that are sent to communicate and transmit the word of the Lord to the people, they start getting this notion of this king that's going to come. And what's really interesting, we don't have time to go into all the verses, but they put, start putting more paint on the palette of what this king looks like. More accurate than my sister's drawing at the beginning. They provide some more detail, and they're like, oh, this guy's going to come from this line. He's going to be born. He's going to come from the line of David. He's going to be born in the town of Bethlehem. And this king is going to be a king of kings. He's going to be what they call an anointed one. And so the term anointed one is the term that kind of came, became synonymous with king. And so they came up with this term Messiah to describe this king. Because often when, when a king was coronated, when a king was, when they created king, they would anoint his head with oil. And so all the prophets started talking to each other and started talking to Israel and they talked about this Messiah, this anointed one that would come. And they believed that this person would be a son of man and a son of God. This person would somehow be fully human, but also one and equal with the divine, as if this king would be like God's very presence on earth. The fullness of God would dwell in this king, and he would bring about the right rule and reign of God. And so they waited, and they waited. And the prophet Isaiah, you see this a lot this time of year, he describes it like this. He says, people in the future are going to look back, and they're going to say this. In Isaiah 9, we see this. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor. This king will be called Mighty God. Again, man, but also one with God. <clears throat> Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on whose throne? Whose throne? Who is it? David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and, everyone say, forever. Forever. And so we see this connection here in Isaiah to the promise that was made to David. And this happened so many times in the prophets, but we don't have time to cover it. And so the prophets kind of end the Old Testament and check this out. They're waiting for this king this embodiment of God around the people, this promised king that would come from the line of David and reign forever with justice and righteousness because from the first pages of the Bible on, it's nothing but justice and unrighteousness when we get our hands on stuff. And so they wait, and they wait, and they wait. And from the Old Testament to the New Testament, there's not one, but 400 years of silence. And the people are waiting for this king. And then we get into the New Testament, and in, especially the Gospel of Luke is great about this. Story opens up, bursts onto the scene, and we get some good news. This long-awaited, long-promised king that's going to do all the stuff that Israel failed to do, that people failed to do, that's going to bring about this universal reign of God's goodness and grace and kindness forever. This king, his entrance and his arrival is proclaimed. And we see this in some of the Christmas stories that we read. So in Luke chapter 1, we're going to go to verse 30, and we see that this messenger of the Lord appears to Mary, and he says this, but the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. Again, just a guy, but also fully God, God's presence dwelling amongst mankind in some profound and mysterious way. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father who? Father who? David, pointing back to that promise, the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants. You could also put the word Israel there. Israel's descendants forever. Everyone say forever. That's right. His kingdom will never end. So Mary's hype about this. And we, if we've been reading the Bible consistently, we see, oh, oh snap, that's a connection to what Isaiah spoke and all the prophets about this king, this Messiah that would come. And it ties back to the promise of David. It actually ties back to the promise of Israel. And we see this continuity. We see this string, this thread running through. 
But the angels and the messengers of the Lord not only communicate to Mary, but they also, they widen the scope of the message. And so they appear to these shepherds, these guys that were like on the low end of the economic totem pole. They appear to these guys, these stinky shepherds out in the field, dude, and they're not making a lot of money. They don't have a 401k. They're not like raking in cash. They appear to kind of the lowliest of the lowly at the time. And they say this. <clears throat> but the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I don't know how scary angels are, but they always say that. Like, don't be afraid. Blah, 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 blah. Just relax. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of who? The town of who? David, a savior has been born to you. He is what do you know? He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. So these Jewish shepherds that knew this history, they knew this story, the messengers of the Lord are pointing them back. And they're like, yeah, from the line of David. And this is going to be the long-awaited anointed king. Fully God, fully man. That's going to bring about this reign of peace and righteousness and justice. And so the shepherds are hype about this and they go and tell other people. And then Jesus is born. Now, before we move forward, when you hear the term Messiah, and even when you see it here in the New Testament, Messiah, one thing I want to point out to you, just when you're reading your Bibles, um, who here has ever like, heard the word like Christ used to describe Jesus? Like Jesus, like, like is his last name? So show of hands, who's ever heard the word Christ in the Bible, Jesus Christ, right? Well, Christ is just the Greek word for Messiah. So every time you see that in the New Testament, you can see the word Messiah there. That's how tied together, this is how uh, interconnected all of this is, all of this story is, this brilliant story God's been writing. And so Jesus is born, and it's celebrated, and then we see Jesus' life. And in Jesus' life, one of the most common denominators between all four books of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, one of the most common themes is that Jesus went around and he preached what's called the kingdom of heaven. And this could be a whole sermon in and of itself, but what you need to know about the kingdom of heaven is that it is God's right rule and reign on the earth. It is life as God intended at creation, as he intended for Israel to help bring about. That was part of their calling. It's on earth as it is in heaven. His kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Jesus invited people into this kingdom of heaven. He invited people to follow his example, to follow his lead, to follow and believe and trust in the promises of God. And this kingdom of the day was weird because it was like this upside down kingdom. Because at the time, the whole world was ruled by this empire called Rome. And Rome ruled and dominated with military force and might. And you only had significance if you were a man and had like good social standing and you were wealthy and influential. And that was the kingdom of Rome. And you conquered people that disagreed with you and you were racially superior to others you conquered. And Jesus' kingdom had nothing to do with that. It was a subversive kingdom, this upside down kingdom, this way of life that Jesus called people into. And he wouldn't say like, oh, some people are better than others. He says, no, you should consider yourself less than others. And it's a kingdom where now you don't like praise and, and cheer for the greatest. He's like, no, the least are the greatest, the servant of all. And you don't praise like, ooh, religious leaders. Oh, we love them. I follow them on Instagram. No, it's like children, children. Like we should be more like children and we should trust and be faithful to the Lord like children. It's this upside down kingdom that Jesus preached. And guess what? It got a huge following. And so Jesus goes around and he preaches this kingdom of heaven. And then we see Jesus and this is part of another storyline of the Bible, but we see Jesus eventually crucified. And he was doing this profound and one-time thing in that, in that he was taking on all punishment for all sin and all guilt for all time, as the book of Hebrews describes it. Once for all sacrifice, so forever people would know they're in right standing with God. And here's the important thing. We can't ever stop at the cross because three days later, Jesus rose again and he demonstrated victory victory over sin and guilt and death. And he was like this king that you, when you see on the cross, you be like, oh, that's, uh, well, that king got defeated. That kingdom's not going to last. Uh, except that it did. And in <laughs> irrefutable historical accounts, yes, Jesus rose from the grave and demonstrated this victory. And a lot of the New Testament writers write about the resurrection in this way. This one New Testament writer looks back at what Jesus did, at what King Jesus did and said, uh, Jesus would be like, uh, grave, where's your sting? Where's your victory? Come at me. Death, sin, where's your sting? No, you're defeated. Come at me, fall back. 
And so Jesus raised to life again as the king of kings. Not only over like the systems and the government of the day and all the bad kings that had come in Israel. No, but like over like sin and death and defeat itself. He rose victorious. And sometimes we don't use the word victorious when you describe what Jesus did, but we should. And so then... At the end of Jesus' time on earth, he sent out his disciples. And we call this the Great Commission. And he said, go and make other Jesus followers. And and essentially, in a sense, what he's saying is, go, take this message of the kingdom of heaven. Take what I've given you, what I've taught you, what I've shown you, what I've done for you, and carry it to the ends of the stinking earth. Take it. Go. And what we see in the New Testament, especially from the book of Acts on, is the story actually spreads. It spreads like wildfire through, through this huge empire. And what's trippy is that Rome, who was this giant empire of the day, they had such a hard time wrangling people together and like keeping things together. The kingdom of heaven, the story of Jesus, the kingship of Jesus, it spread like wildfire. Like it, people didn't even have to try. They spoke a word and it just spread. And what's crazy is culture began to change. And people started living or viewing them, viewed themselves as living in a different kind of kingdom with a different kind of king. In fact, in this day and this time, Caesar was over the Roman Empire. And oftentimes people would walk by and greet each other or say goodbye to each other with this. They would say, Caesar is Lord. Caesar is Lord. What's good? Caesar is Lord. Hey, how's it going? Caesar is Lord. Catch you later. Caesar is Lord. And these Jesus followers early on took this language and they're like, now I'm gonna bite off this. I'm gonna work this around. And people would say, hey, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is King. They would start referring to Jesus as Son of God. He's the Son of God. Because in the Roman Empire, if you had a coin, it would have the face of Caesar on it and it would say Son of God on it. And Christians were like, or the early Jesus followers were like, um, um, actually, uh, Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is King. And they were faithful to the state. They obeyed the laws and they paid taxes, but they didn't view Caesar as their Lord. No, no, no. Caesar was not the king. Jesus was. And in fact, there was this famous saying in the Roman Empire that there's no other name under heaven given to people whereby they can be saved except the name of Caesar. And the early Jesus followers were like, oh, okay. Um, We're going to bite off that real quick and work this around. And when they say there's no other name under heaven given to people whereby they can be saved except the name of, well, remix, Jesus. And so they didn't view Caesar as their king, ruling by military might and violence and superiority. No, Jesus was their king. And so then the church went on, the church church continues to spread, and then at the end of the New Testament, you get this book called Revelation, and the church awaits the promised second coming of Jesus, because in Jesus' time on earth, he said, "Uh, I'm going to be back. And in the meantime, in between time, grow the kingdom. Go and make followers of me, more followers of me. And so we see in Revelation this vision of Jesus returning as not like a good religious leader, or not as like an influential pastor. No, it's like Jesus comes back as king. The king of kings. And this is the kind of victory and the kind of confidence that the church lived with. And so, the church, from this point on, has been in a season, much like Israel between the Old and New Testament, they've been in a season of waiting. Waiting for Jesus to return. And in this, the church wanted to come up with a way where they could look back and celebrate the birth of Jesus, but also look forward and anticipate the return of Jesus. The church kind of in the the meantime and between time wanted to look back and celebrate the birth and look forward and anticipate the return. And they wanted to live in this tension. And so they came up with this observance, this season in the church called Advent. And we've actually been talking about this in our middle school environment. And a lot of times in church today, we don't talk about Advent. And so it's something I wanted to emphasize before we go to Christmas break. And Advent, the word Advent actually means excited anticipation waiting for a king. Or excitement and anticipation for the arrival of a king. It's that feeling where it's like, you know, when you're a kid, like right before Christmas morning, you're like, oh my gosh, I can't even contain my excitement. Or like me this week with the new Star Wars coming out, I'm like, (laughs) I can't even sleep. It's that excitement. It's that hype. It's like, I mean, you're all from Atlanta, so you don't know what this is like. But like if your team wins the Super Bowl or like the World Series, (laughs) uh, it's that hype people get when the team rolls into town. That's what Advent is. It's that kind of anticipation and excitement, that celebration. And so the church came up with this to look back and to look forward and to find where they are in between. And so looking back, what the church did traditionally, let me just give you like, like two minutes of church history here. 
they would look back at the promises of the Old Testament that we talked about today and all the scriptures leading to Jesus, all the scriptures about the kingship of Jesus and about the deliverance of Israel. They would look back and they would recall those and they would do this for four Sundays leading up to Christmas. So this is technically in this model and in this calendar. This is the last Sunday of Advent and then we'll celebrate Christmas. And so they would do this for four Sundays and it was cool because they would like live in Israel's story in order to understand their story and the story to come. So, weird analogy, I had some friends in high school, uh, we lived close to like a Civil War museum, or, like a Civil War like battlefield, and I had this one friend on my basketball team who would go do Civil War reenactments. I've also met people that do Revolutionary War reenactments. And so, they got like the, the gear and the costumes and stuff and like muskets and all this. So, uh, while it's a little strange to me, they kind of like live in this story. They kind of like live in this, and, and that's kind of what Advent is. It's like we like live in the story of Israel, and we see ourselves connected in that same stage of waiting, and we see the goodness of God as it's developed throughout the story. It's kind of like at 4th of July, how we, we look back at our nation's history, and we think about the birth and the start of America. That's kind of what we do in Advent, and what we call this is First Advent, Looking back, celebrating, anticipating the birth of Jesus, the arrival of the king, the fulfilled promises of God, of this Messiah, this God in the flesh, God making his dwelling among us in Jesus. But then the church would also look forward to what we call Second Advent, and it's the return of Jesus. And we should have the same level of excitement and hype about this as the people of Israel did when Jesus was born and when he was walking the earth. And here's what's crazy. I grew up in church since I was in like kindergarten, and I never once in the history of my history in the church ever talked about the second coming at Christmas time. People probably think that's weird. Like, why are you talking about Jesus coming back? It's Christmas. We got to talk about baby Jesus, baby Yehu. But no, this is something in the church's history where we've done both. We celebrate the arrival of the king, and we anticipate the second coming of Jesus. That is promised. And what we do in the meantime, in the in-between time, is we live in what we call, I'm going to give you just kind of one nerdy phrase here, we live in what's called the inter-advent period. Jesus has come, started his kingdom, invites us into that, and he will return, and he will make things right. And we live in the meantime, in-between time, in the inter-advent. And what's cool is at Christmas time, <laughs> who doesn't love Christmas music? And especially like, I like old school, like Christmas carols. What's cool is we're able to find ourselves kind of anachronistic and like we find ourselves in these different time periods and we can sing songs like, Oh Come, Oh Come, Emmanuel, one of my favorite songs. And in doing that, we put ourselves in Israel's shoes and we imagine what it must have been like for them to wait for this long awaited king. But then our story is the same because we're still waiting for God to return. We're waiting for Jesus to come back. And so we can kind of like live in their story and breathe in their story. Another song, the song we uh, start out with today, Oh Holy Night. My favorite part of that is the second verse. It says, change shall he break for the slave is our brother and in his name all oppression shall cease. Well, when Jesus came, he proclaimed good news to the captives and freedom for the slaves and he taught about the, the, how we're all... We talked about brotherhood and sisterhood and how we're all one, and that was a pervasive teaching of the early church. And so that was like profound to these people living in the first advent when Jesus first came. But the same is true of us today as we sing. We sing that in anticipation for the day when Jesus will return and truly and finally, I'll use that word, and finally change shall he break for the slave is our brother. Human trafficking will stop. Slavery will stop. Racism will stop. And in his name, all oppression shall cease. That gets me in my feels and that gets me hyped for the return of Jesus. And so when we sing these songs, when we celebrate the Christmas story, again, we kind of get to live in their world and we kind of get to wait for the world to come and we're in between. And so in the in-between, as we find ourselves here, we're living in the church. We are a church, a collection of Jesus followers, and we live as part of the kingdom of heaven and under the kingship of Jesus. And so in that, I want to go back to our first question. Who's in charge of your life? Because here's the deal. Uh, we should ask this as a church. Like, who's in charge of us as a church? Why do we gather together here? Do we gather together under the kingship and the lordship of Jesus? Or do we just gather here to sing a couple of songs and hear like a message that'll make you feel good for a day or two and then I'll forget about it? Or do we really come here to submit ourselves to the lordship of Jesus and say, hey, uh, I am not in charge of my life. You are. Uh, I'm just going to mess it up. And so, like, I know you have come and you will return and I'm living in between and I want to live in your kingdom and under your authority. That's as a church that should be our posture. 
But here's the deal. That should be our personal posture as well. Individually, I want to apply this to you guys. I want to ask you specifically the question, who's in charge of your life? And so I want to do this. Rather than give you an, an umbrella question, I want to break it down in nuance, and then you guys will expound upon this in your groups, okay? But let me just ask this. Like, what is surrender to the Lord? Who's in charge of these aspects in these areas of your life? Your time and your schedule. Is Jesus king? Is Jesus lord over your time and schedule? Or is Jesus like, <laughs> uh, like maybe like 10th, 11th, or 12th priority? If that. Are you, I mean, some of you, I could give you a guilt trip of like, you should be at church every Sunday. But honestly, you should be at church every Sunday. But we should also be making time to think about the Lord, to pray, to have conversation and, be in, and commune with the Lord. We should make time to read the Word. Maybe some of you wake up first thing in the morning, you reach for your phone, and you start your Instagram scroll and your Snapchat scroll. Maybe instead, read one verse. There's so many reading plans and Bible apps. Read one verse. And if you're like, I don't get it, I honestly think that's okay for now. Let that seep in. It says to, to hide his word in your heart that you might not sin against him. Just let that stuff just seep in. Make that time. Your time and your schedule. Even when it comes to like your future and you're balancing your week. If you're like, man, I made myself so busy. <laughs> Ain't nobody got time for church. Maybe that's not right. Maybe your time and your schedule are not under the lordship and the kingship of Jesus. Maybe you need to move that right up on, under the crown. Second thing, words and actions. I think sometimes we go like, I got a church. I'm a Christian. Okay, that's cool, but like, are your actions and your words surrendered to the lordship of Jesus? Let me put it this way. Are they on brand with Jesus and his kingdom and the kingdom of heaven? Are you speaking to people in a way that Jesus would go, yep, that's, that's me. Are you treating people in a way that Jesus would go, yep, that's me. Or are we speaking unkind words about people? Are we talking about people behind their back? Are we like, hey, backstabbing people. Now you're dead. Like, how we, how we handle and how we act and how we speak, is that under the lordship and the command of Jesus? Or do we need to surrender that? Another thing, screens, our whole lives. Are your screens under the lordship of Jesus? Are they on brand with Jesus and his kingdom? Are you putting stuff out on your social media that if Jesus saw would be like, <laughs> no, uh, no I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know him. I don't, I'm not sure. That, I would not agree with that statement. Are you putting stuff on other people's walls or DMing stuff to people that Jesus would be like, you did what? Not on brand. That's not part of my kingdom. I don't know what, kind of, what kingdom that's part of. I don't know who approved of that. Or, let's not get too weird or detailed, other stuff you may be looking at on your screen that you shouldn't be. Is that on brand? If, you're, if Jesus walked up and you're like, oh, I'm just doing this, would Jesus be okay with that? Is that on brand? Is that surrender to the lordship, the kingship of Jesus? Here's another one. And we had to talk about this. I try not to do it a lot because when I was in youth group, I felt like we talked about it like every other Sunday. But here, I'm going to just go for it. Ready? Your sexuality. Is that surrender to the lordship of Jesus? And how you portray yourself, identify yourself, carry yourself, interact with other people. Is your sexuality under the lordship of Jesus? And one of the greatest temptations, especially as you get into 10th, 11th, and 12th grade, is, is your sexuality. Trying to figure it out. Trying to figure out how I live with it and express it. And how to guard and protect the image of God in yourself. And how you interact with maybe someone you're dating. And so maybe some of you here today are like, yeah, I'm kind of on this trajectory where I'm like, uh, I'm kind of questioning, like, I think I can be a Christian and do this. Let me just ask, would Jesus say that same thing? And you don't have to look far. You can look at his word. You can talk to your group leader. You can ask me about it. Like, is that something that's on brand with Jesus? Is that under the lordship of Jesus? If you told Jesus, hey, King Jesus, it's, I'm, I'm going to do this real quick. Is that cool? And if, <laughs> like, try to look at it that way in your head. Imagine that. Because if it's something that strays from kingdom living, how Jesus has called you to live, then Jesus is going to say, uh, no, not on brand. Not under my rulership or my kingship. And maybe you're doing stuff now that is not surrendered to the lordship of Jesus and you need to say, yeah, I'm just kind of making that decision on my own because it feels right and seems right to me. Well, that's not what we're here to ask. We're here to ask, hey, who's really in charge? What do we bring under the lordship of Jesus? Last thing, your past hurts and your future fears. Maybe some of you, what defines your life and your existence, and we touched on this last week, is all the stuff that's happened in your past. Maybe hurtful words, maybe mistakes you've made, maybe things people have said about you, and that guides your life, and that leads you, and that propels you forward, and you make certain decisions out of that because you're like, well, this happened to me, and so I'm just kind of subservient to that, and I just kind of go with that. No, you're not called to your past. You're not called to past hurts or guilt or bitterness or anger or any of that. No, you're called to follow Jesus. You are called into new life. It says that he who is in, in Messiah, in Christ Jesus, is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. 
And so you might be here today and you might be just enslaved to your past. No, that does not need to be the case. Jesus is king. Jesus is Lord over that. And maybe those past hurts and, and that past guilt, you need to bring under the lordship and the kingship of Jesus. And your future fears. A lot of you, ooh, especially seniors, ooh, especially seniors, you got all that uncertainty in the future though, right? You got all that like, I don't know what I'm going to do. What are your plans after graduation? <laughs> I'll let you know after graduation. <laughs> And you got that, or you might be getting that like turning stomach of like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I have nothing. And maybe your future are going into that school. Like I have to, I kneel before this university of this because I have to get in. And that is my identity. That is my whole future. I mean, that school's fine objectively, but if that's king, if that's priority, if that's superior, you need to bring that junk under the lordship of Jesus. And Jesus might say, hey, this university is just fine. More importantly, follow me. And so my invitation to you guys today is to bring all of this under the lordship of Jesus and surrender that. So here's what I want you to do. Here's our walk off for today. I want you to take this question to your groups. Who's in charge of your life? I want, to, I want you guys to talk about it. Talk about these various aspects of your life and, and talk about which ones you feel like, oh yeah, I probably need to bring that junk under the rulership and the lordship of Jesus, under, into the kingdom of heaven and kingdom life. Ask the question. But here's another thing. I want to give you something visceral, something tangible. The artwork for this series is going to be on our social media later, on our story. And it's going to be kind of in this format. Let's go to the next slide. Um, we have it kind of in the thin story version. And I'm just going to invite you guys. Take a screenshot of it. I'm not trying to like promote here, right? But just take a screenshot of it. Make it your background for the next week. Or as you head into the new year, make it your background. So you can look at that crown and think about, okay, what needs to go under that? What needs to go under the rulership and the kingship of Jesus? Maybe have it. Like when you wake up in the morning and you reach to, to do your Insta scroll, you're like, oh yeah, king of kings. Okay, let me, let me prioritize my time and schedule a little bit differently. Or you're in a situation where you're like, I'm going to look at something on my phone or like post something. I probably shouldn't, but I'm going to just go for it. Ugh, king of kings. Or when you're in a potentially tempting situation or a situation that could be problematic, because we're on our phones all the time, you look down and you go, oh yeah, king of kings, I need to bring this junk under the rulership of Jesus. So ask the question, take the screenshot, be reminded, but here's the other thing we're going to do to end today. We're going to sing two songs. For me, I grew up doing music. Music has a way of preaching to me and bringing something out of me that nothing else does. Music is profound and powerful in this way. And so as we sing these next two songs, they are going to specifically and explicitly talk about the kingship of Jesus, this thing we've been talking about today. And it's bigger than Jesus is the greatest gift. It's bigger than born to die. It's Jesus is king of kings from beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible to the end of time. Jesus is king. And so I want us to get hype about it in, the, in these songs. I I want us to let the words kind of soak into our souls, and I want you to respond. And as you're singing these next two songs, here's what I want you to do. I want you to find that thing that you need to surrender to the Lord, that you need to bring under the lordship and the kingship of Jesus, and say, hey, take that. So I'm going to invite you guys to the front real quick. I'm going to invite you to the front. You're like, normally you pray out first. No, I'm going to invite you to the front first, because I want to make sure you do it. I'm going to invite everyone up to the front. And we're going to sing this out together. And we're going to sing in response. And you ask yourself, what do I need to bring unto the lordship of Jesus? What do I need to surrender today to the king of kings? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for your goodness and your kindness and your grace. And may we view Christmas not as just like, okay, cool. It's a cool gift that's been given to us. It is, Lord. We thank you for the gift. But we know it's bigger. May we not just say, hey, well, Jesus was born so he could die for my sins. Lord, we know that is true. And we thank you for that. But we know it's even bigger than in that because you called us to live in new life. And so may we live in that inter-advent period, that in-between time as the church. And may we celebrate your kingship over the world and over the church and specifically over our lives. And so Lord, we open up our palms and our hearts and our minds to you today and we surrender our whole lives to you, the King of Kings. And we pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.